What does that say, basically? Um, it basically says that if the Euler-Lagrange equation happens to be zero over zero, I mean zero equals zero, excuse me, um, it means that any function is a potential minimizer. Um, and obviously, so if if the integral is like this, from say A to B, and you want to minimize this over a certain uh, set of admissible paths, you will end up with the Euler-Lagrange equation. Of course, if you don't do kind of a silly mistake, which I've seen a few. Um, well, no mistake is silly, but just typo. Um, you end up with 0 equals 0. Or, you know, I think u prime minus u prime equals 0. So basically that's 0 equals 0, right? And that's um, really because the integrand there is a perfect derivative u square over 2. So that's just u of b squared minus u of a squared over 2. So, so that's a very kind of degenerate case when you're trying to minimize, in fact, not an integral, but just valleys at the end point. So depending on what the admissible paths you have, for instance, if you choose admissible paths to have fixed endpoints, then that's a fixed number. So any path between those two points will be optimal, right? If you don't fix, uh, for instance, neither of the two endpoints, then certainly you can make this as small as negative infinity, right? So there's no optimal solution. If you fix the endpoint at B, but leave this open, then again this can go to negative infinity, right? So there's no optimal solution. And finally, if you fix the endpoint at, at A, then there is a minimum, right? The minimum is when this is zero. So there, is, there are optimal solutions. But nothing is, is uh, kind of, uh, you gain nothing from the Euler-Lagrange equations, OK? That's the only thing. But anyway, that was just an observation. So um, I marked on some of the homeworks just as a comment. Um, <clears throat> This was number three. Number five, that was pretty straightforward. The Euler-Lagrange equations ended up being the usual, well, u double prime minus u equals zero. Um, and you just have to solve it for these two endpoints. Okay, so the minimization is achieved. Well, okay, the Euler-Lagrange equation has a solution starting at 0, ended up in a 1. Yeah, and it has the shape of a I think sine hyperbolic. Over with with some constant, just so you can uh, so you can um, reach one at once. So okay, but it's that's the shape. Okay, so. Uh, just as, just as an idea, when you whenever you kind of optimize something, imagine the picture or or draw the picture. You know, once you're done, just say, well, 
this is how it really looks like um, because it's kind of useful. And um, what was the other one? In problem number 10, of course, problem number 10 was a little bit, I mean, had sort of a um, um, hidden motive. Um, and that's related to what we talked last time on dynamic programming. Uh, but anyway, that was a very simple situation here. If you had, and log of 2 was just so, so the computations were easy, but just if you have an interval from A to B, let's say from 0 to 1, um, well, let me say from A to B, like a general, um, and you have to, optimize, you have to minimize this functional subject to x of 0 is x of a is a, okay, and x of b, well, first of all, let's start with x of a is a, that's it, no, no, no constraint at the other end. No, so it's a free end. Okay? Then, assuming this has a, this has a uh, optimal solution, then this minimum is actually going to be uh, some, we, what we denote it by the value function, right? So that's the value function for this particular problem. We, we call it the value function, but it's evaluated at the initial point A and starting at little a at capital A, right? <coughs> if you consider now, and of course the optimal should, so the optimal path should really um, satisfy the Euler-Lagrange equations plus what conditions? Uh, we use x. x at a is a and of course in this case is more general and zero, right? the natural boundary condition at the other end point. If, if it didn't exist, if, if there was no fixed uh, bound, um, end point there, then these are the boundary conditions that you have to use, right? So that's the direct way of sort of, uh, sort of finding this value, uh, optimal value of the, of the uh, problem. But you can actually think of it as also, so that's the direct, direct way. But sort of indirect, you could say, well, I don't really like dealing with, you know, natural boundary conditions. I don't want to impose any. Uh, I don't want to work with free endpoints. In which case. You could say, let's just call whatever it is uh, at the right end point. Let's give it a name. Then we're going to fix this, say y, and we're going to minimize the same integral from a to b. I mean, it's the same thing, but over this additional. Restriction. So basically, the admissible paths in this problem are a subset of the admissible paths in the, in the original problem. Okay. So the value function will actually be a function of, of whatever you fix at the right end point, right? And then. 
the original problem will be the minimum over y's of f of y. That's it. Right? So that's the connection between this direct, if you want an indirect method. But So the computation of doing uh, the first one should have given you sort of the value function for a specific y, which after, after which you minimize and get um, get the uh, the, uh, the value function for the for the um, problem without the right right end being fixed. Finally, let me say a few words about this last problem. So, minimizing basically the integral of the derivative squared, where the admissible sets are Oh, this, the admissible paths satisfy u of 0 less than 1, u of 1 equals 1, integral from 1, 0 to 1, u of x squared less than 2, and integral from 0 to 1, u of x dx equals 1. Um, and as I said, one should kind of convert u of 0. I mean, there are two ways. Actually, there are two ways to do this. Uh, one is convert this to an inequality constraint, which we said is minus u prime dx integrated less than 1, less than 0, less than or equal to 0. That's fundamental theorem of calculus. And that would be sort of the g1 of x u of u prime so that's going to be, I'm sorry, that's the integrand. So it's minus u prime. And of course, the other one would be the u squared less than or equal to 2. So you have the integral from 0 to 1 of, I'm sorry, you have g2 equals. u squared, right? And integral from 0 to 1, u of x is 1. That means the equality constraint has the integrand, in a, integral constraint is like this. So you end up with f tilde, which is f plus y1 g1 plus y2 g2 plus z h. Right? And now you write the euler lagrange equation for this <coughs> kind of augmented um, or auxiliary uh, functional and that's going to look like what? So what was f? f was one half u prime squared. This was minus u prime, y2, this is u squared plus z times u. Okay, so the Euler Lagrange are saying f u minus derivative with respect to x, f tilde with respect to u prime equals zero. And if you do this sort of carefully, you get two y2 u plus z, that's the first one, minus through with respect to x of u prime minus y1 plus y1, actually <coughs> mi minus y1, equals 0. y1 is a constant, so it just comes up with u double prime plus 2y2u equals z, uh, minus. Okay, and in addition to the Euler Lagrange equations, you have to have what? Y1 times the integral of G1 
minus 0 equals 0, y2, the integral of g2 minus 2 was, I think, equals 0, y1 positive, y2 positive, you know, and of course, the integral of g1, integral of g2, integral of h equals whatever it was, okay? So that's the kind of the equivalent of KKT system. Uh, let me remind you, G1 basically just says I mean, G1, the integral of G1 was just the minus the integral of the deriv derivative, so it ends up being U0 is 1 or not, right? And of course, this was just right. So what you do is the cases you're going to have to to deal with is either so four cases, right? Let's start with y1. Either y, either y1 is 0, right? Or u0 is 1, and of course either y2 is 0, or the integral of u squared equals 2, right? So you have four combinations. I mean, and okay. So as I said in the homework, since this were two, maybe too many cases, you could have just said, well, let's just you know do equality constraint for for u at zero at one. One, and if you don't, so if you want to, if you consider all four cases, then you you might have to consider you have to consider other two cases if y one is zero. Let's see what what is y one equals zero by you here. Well, in in the euler Lagrange equation, it doesn't make any difference, right? It is only when you get to. Um, To the inequality constraint here that u0 has to be less than or equal than 1. So I don't know. Let's 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 say uh, let's consider all four cases and let's I mean which which case do you want to work it out? I mean maybe a case that no I mean, very few of you actually considered. Let's take a case when, um, so say, let's take a case when 1y is 0, right? And um, I don't know, you, you pick. y2 is 0 or not? y2 is 0. Okay. So, y2 is 0, Euler Lagrange equation is, are simpler. So, it's u double prime equals z. That's u double prime of, of x, right? So, u prime is, one, uh, is uh, zx plus some constant, let's say d1, so u of x is 1 half zx squared plus d1x plus d2, okay? So what is this doing? This is basically saying
these are the candidates for the minimum, right? Of course, we have to look at other things like, you know, we have, we have some other restrictions on u, like u of 1 is 1, integral of u of x dx is 1, right? And two inequality constraints. Well, let's see what this equality constraints give you. One half z plus d1 plus d2 is 1. And the integral. Well, the integral is, let's see, integral of x squared is x cubed over 3. So that's 1 6 z plus d1 over 2 plus d2 equals 1, right? And the inequality constraints are u of 0 less than or equal than 1 and integral of from 0 to 1 u squared less than or equal than 2. So those are d2 less than or equal than 1 and the square of u that's kind of a mess. Um, let's just keep that in mind. We have to square that and make it less than or equal than 2. <coughs> okay? And what do we want to minimize? Well, we want to minimize the integral of u prime squared with a half in front. So I can look at u prime from this, so it's going to be zx plus d1. squared dx, right? So that's going to be what? z square x squared plus 2z d1x plus d1 squared. So it's what? 1 6 z squared plus z d1 plus 1 half d1 squared. I believe. No, this is one half. There's a one half here. Okay. So what you get, in fact, is. I mean, here's, here's one, one way to kind of solve this case. You know, z is that, uh, Lagrange, you know, is sort of the equivalent, equivalent of the Lagrange multiplier. So what you can do is you can find z from the first equation, or one of the two equations. In terms of d1, d2. Plugging back in here, right, and get a quadratic expression in terms of d1 and d2. Okay? So let's say what, what that looks like. So from z1 1 half plus d1 plus d2 equals 1. You can get z1 is 2 minus 2 d1 plus d2. z2 
Z, excuse me, not Z1. Okay, so the problem that you have to minimize is becomes this one. One six two minus two d one plus d two squared plus one half two minus two d one plus d two d one plus one half d one squared. This is quadratic in d1, d2, subject to, and what are the constraints? Well, there is an equality constraint here in terms of d1 and d2. Okay? If you eliminate z, then you get a, a, a one equality constraint in terms of just multiply by 3, the second one, and subtract the two of them, and you get what? Three halves minus, D minus 1 is 1 half, 3 minus 2 is, so let's, let's just get this. So you get 3 halves minus 1 half. So it's d1 over 2 and 3d2. I'm multiplying this by 3. So 2d2 equals 2. Right? So d1 plus 4d2 equals 4. d1 plus 4d2 equals 4. d1 has to be d2 less than 1 and one more which kind of comes from this inequality, okay? Well, you already can see this in the plane D1, D2 that it's it's restricted to you know one one equality constraint is already giving you a line so what's the line four and one right d2 cannot exceed two a uh, one excuse me so basically the feasible set is well some subset of this of this of this portion, right? When you figure out what that quadratic expression d1, d2 is, um, um, even ignoring this, I mean, of course, you, you can get another inequality from here, which would restrict even more, probably to a line segment, right? Um, and then you have to minimize this quadratic expression. Um, and this case is going to turn out to be this endpoint. Okay? So d1 equals 0 and d2 equals 1. d1 equals 0, d2 equals 1 is the solution here, is the solution here. And it verifies also to be the solution here. So ends up being this is the optimal meaning that D2 has to be equal to 1 and if you go back this inequality came from U of 0 has to equal 1. Okay. So because of this, uh, ends up making the, that assumption 
that's why I sort of kind of uh, told you to restrict to say u of 0 equals 1 because it turns out that if you make this assumption u1 equals 0 then that's that's where the optimal is, is achieved anyway <coughs> so you can have that's an example where you can have in that KKT situation you can have y0 and this b0 Okay, so this are, one doesn't exclude the other. They're not exclusive. Okay? So that basically says, well, this case reduces to this and this case, right? And, uh, well, and that case will be what? Well, D1, we said D2 has to be 0. Uh, D2 has to be 1 and D, D1 has to be 0. So now you trace back. It means, well, we don't care about Z as much, right? But it ends up being, if, D1, if D2 is 1, D1 is 0, then so is Z, right? And then you look at what is the solution. Solution is 0, 0. <coughs> and just D2, which is 1. Well, so this means Z equals 0. So it means this is 0 times X squared plus 0 times X plus 1. So U of X is 1. Now, this is Again, making the picture is, again, once you're finished, make a picture to kind of look at what you've got. Well, what you've got is, not only the picture, but look at the value of the optimal value of the problem. The optimal value is when, when u is achieved when u is a constant. So u prime is 0. So this is 0, right? So... What does it mean? It means that the constraints, I mean, this was an important constraint, right? And this was an important constraint. I mean, the quality constraints are always important. The inequality constraints may be or may not be relevant, right? So it basically says that if I had just this equality constraints and minimize this only over uh, those, th that feasible region, well, you would have u prime 0 means u is linear. Well, what, what function can be linear at 1 at 1 and integrate to 1 over the interval 0 to 1? This is the only one, right? Because any other line, any other linear function would have area either less or more than one. Right? So it means that neither of, the, uh, I mean, the other two constraints are not let's see, are binding or not? Well, this one was not. Uh, uh, this one is binding, right? Because it, it is achieved when u is 0, 1, but the other one is not. Okay? Now, the situation could have been totally different if, for instance, this was not an admissible path. And how can you make it not to be an admissible path? For instance, the inequality constraint could say... Well, even the equality constraint, I mean, certainly if you put the equality constraint to be not one, but a half, right? And the inequality constraint, something kind of weird, more weird, more restrictive, right? Then you would not have this as an admissible path. So you wouldn't have, for instance, the, the optimal value to be zero. Let me give you that example that um, 
we talked last time. If you want to minimize, again, just the inter uh, derivative of squared subject to the integral from, uh, just subject to the integral to be 1. And u of 0 is 1, and u of 1 is 0. This is x, and this is u. Okay? So what are, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to get from this point down to this point through a path that has, you know, area and the path is 1, right? To minimize that thing. Well, that thing has, if you didn't have this equality integral constraint, that you could just, we said that the Euler Lagrange equation just says u double prime equals 0, so u is a straight line. Okay? And I even showed you how to discretize that. But now we have this constraint, so that line is no longer admissible, the straight line. Okay? So how do you do it? Kind of you follow that uh, procedure, so you say f tilde is, you know, one half u prime squared plus z u, right? And the Euler Lagrange for this uh, func function or integrand is f u, so that's z minus. d by dx u prime equals 0. So u double prime equals z. So that's u of x is 1 half z x squared plus d1 x plus d2. So it is a quadratic shape. And how do you find d1, d2? In this case, you have three equations. Solve for z, d1, d2. Okay, they're all um, yeah, they're all linear in z1, z uh, in z in d1 and d2. Hmm? Yeah, so d1, d2 is one automatically, but okay, and just think about it. How can you kind of draw a parabolic shape? from here to here so that the area underneath is 1 well it's clearly you cannot go straight down here right you have to go up and then come down so it has to be something like like this okay now I want to show you I promised uh, I'm going to show you how to uh, discretize, uh, you know, this kind of problems with constraints, because that's something we haven't done. So I posted the uh, the codes for this. And it, so, to discretize such variational problems, um, it's the same story. You basically say, I'm going to discretize the interval. Um, so it's posted on, that, on, on our website, but I'm talking about, you know, discretizing, and here we use x. I mean, I use x instead of u, but and t instead of x, so um, to minimize the integral of the, square of the square of the derivative of the interval on the interval 0, 1, under the restriction, the integral is um, a certain number, like 1, and of course, the, bound, the boundary conditions. So with constraints, 
with integral constraints. Actually, it doesn't have to be integral. Um, MATLAB has f min con as part of optimization toolbox. So if you don't have it on your local machine, you have to remote here. But um, it's, it's, very, it's as simple as that f min search except you have you have a f much more flexibility on what kind of constraints you, want, you can impose so this is one liner the command for f min con and let's look at the inputs so the first input is just like in the unconstraint you have to say what function you're minimizing okay so that's going to be defined in a separate fu function file and here I just call it my fun um, then the initial search, the initial like an initial guess. Okay, we're minimizing subject to certain constraints. Then there is this actually long list which reminds you of the linear programming, right? So what it's saying is, if you have equality, inequality constraints that are linear, then you can input them there as far as matrices A for inequality constraints. A, E, Q for equality constraints. So whatever, whatever linear constraints you have, you can put them here. Okay? You can actually put lower bounds and upper bounds. We're, we're talking about discrete optimization here. But the most important thing is if you have nonlinear constraints, then of course those you can put them in, in matrices, in matrix format. So you have to kind of define a function that then de 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 descri that describes those uh, and there's actually one more you could have options so if you're interested you can just go and help on this and it's it's a it's a huge it kind of makes me understand why they charge for this separately because it really is sort of state of the art at least as of the late 90s um, implementation of minimization with constraints okay? and a very simple minded uh, algorithm you could find in the book actually it's a section we skip uh, but it's it's something that you could kind of um, it would be sort of a first iteration of this uh, of these ideas in chapter 4 last section in chapter 4 Okay, so um, let me just show you how this, well, the function, it's very similar to uh, how, how it was implemented in the unconstraint, right? Except here I just took the simpler one, which is just the sum of the xi, xj plus 1 minus xj squared, okay? And I, I also dropped the n plus 1 squared. If you remember, there was an n plus 1 squared factor, but... That's a fixed, for, for fixed n, that's fixed. So you're minimizing with or without that uh, multiplicative constant, that's the same thing. And the constraints is important how you input them. So for the constraints, you, it's very kind of also very flexible. You can actually let, you can also input nonlinear inequality constraints. Okay, now our, our constraint in this example is just integral of u equals 1. So when you discretize that, you get, you know, the sum of xj, right, equals n plus 1, because, so you don't have any inequality constraints, right? So that's why you just put it, like, empty here. And for the equality constraints, as I said, you take the sum of whatever comes up from the main code, in this case is Q, use a capital X, uh, minus n plus 1 because the integral of the sum of those things has to equal n plus 1 or if you divide by n plus 1 you would bas basically get an approximate integral of x minus 1 right so that has to be equal to 0 that's the constraint oh, I mean you define this and back in the main code they set them equal to 0 so that's all and you just run it and you get the values, the discrete values, okay? 
and I chose n equals 20, but guess what? You, you do 50, and here in the command window you see I, I, I allow to, of course if you put an M, a semicolon you won't see that, and it shouldn't see that because it's, it's a mess, but it basically does go through an iteration. Um, and let's run it again with n equals 50. Where is it? Oops. It gives some error, but um, that's because it was actually m minimizing uh, 50, I mean, 50 variables. Anyway, still, you got the shape, the same shape, right? I don't know what the error is. So, if you are interested, if you're interested in the actual, I mean, learning how the what the errors are, are saying, you know, when this code can fail, because it does, certainly can fail. I mean, it's not like a, um, bulletproof, but um, the, the, the help on that on that command is is there, so you can. You can read about it, okay? Um, so, um, so again, I'm not going to assign as a homework, but you can think about any problems that we did as far. I mean, and the reason I'm pointing this is, I mean, the final exam will have something like this. Here's a variational problem with an integral constraint. Um, do it as a continuous problem or Lagrange equation, find the solutions, and then discretize and confirm whatever. Okay? Uh, so, you know, it's a good thing to kind of look through these codes. Um, good example is number 17, part B. The, it's, there's this hanging cable problem, which I don't know if you've been to Golden Gate or uh, to some suspended bridge. And that's related to this, the shape of the sh of the of the hanging um, of the suspension uh, cable. Of course, it's more complicated because it's kind of attached to the structure, so there's a lot of engineering. But um, this hanging pro uh, cable problem is actually solved in the in the section, so you can uh, look at that. It basically says minimize. Um, Minimize what? It looks like it's the same as for the minimal pro, uh, minimum surface, but it's not. I mean, it's the same inter it's the same functional, but uh, where is it at? Yeah, example 515, 162. Okay. It kind of gives you a sort of a motivation why. So see uh, code on the website, and also see hanging hanging cable example 515 on page once it starts on page 162, where you have to minimize. This functional, which you rem remember, we kind of used it in the minimum surface. So the discrete version of this, you already have that in, in that previous code. But here it's a little bit, it comes from the weight of the cable rather than from the area of the, the surface area of rotation. But it's the same thing as minimizing this subject to, and the constraint is that the length, which has this expression has to be fixed. It's not; it doesn't stretch or compress. So it's, and of course, with uh, with also well, I don't know. Let's say it's the same height, right? So, 
two two ways. I mean, two things to do. You have to. I mean, you can do this continue like on a, as a variational problem, right? Or Lagrange, blah blah blah. It's all worked in that example, five fifteen. Uh, discretized version, uh, discretizing. You have the codes. You have you know you know how to discretize this. You just have to see how to change that my con my constraints function to reflect this discretization, right? And run it, and you should be getting the same uh, shape, which is a it's a it's again a cosine hyperbolic, but it's some. It's, it's kind of shifted, but it's 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 a uh, yeah it's odd. Well, because if you if you minimize this without constraints, you get a cosine hyperbolic, right? And if you minimize with this constraint, you get cosine hyperbolic. Um, hmm. Okay. Well, that's that's uh, that's life. <laughs> Still, I mean, this is relevant in giving you the probably the constraints on the parameters on the on the constants there. So um, you may actually get optimal solutions even if the two things are far apart. You should, right? Because you don't have, yeah, you don't have the constraint that U has to be positive. So that's the only uh, different difference in the um, minimum surface area. U was supposed to be positive. Here you can hang, a, you know, as long as as long as the points are for are uh, this L is bigger than one, right? You can hang this a cable from those two points, right? Okay, so that's that's it. Uh, that's that's all I wanted to say. Um, I really want to now start chapter six here. Um, any questions? So I gave you um, a handout which summarizes basically this maximum this uh, principle, and I had to. I hope there is no typo. Uh, do I have an extra copy? Um, because I had to kind of change from maximizing to minimizing, and just a few a few notations there here and there. But um, I think that should be pretty self-explanatory. Well, once once we kind of um, uh, put the foundation on, we, we talk about the foundation of this. So. Let's um, remember the following. We're talking about now a larger class of problems, optimization problems, than variational problems. Those are the following. We're trying to minimize X. I'm gonna change it. Well, okay. This is still a U, but what we have here is T, possibly T, uh, X of T, and U of T, subject to The following sort of constraints: U is U of T is admissible control, and and again, this can mean very many things, right? We're going to see uh, specific cases what what it might mean, but it's it's a set of admissible possible controls that you can apply, and X is given by
some differential, differential equation or differential system. If x is several components, then you may have several differential equations, right? A system of differential equations. And in, in the right-hand side of those differential equations appears this u, right? So now, everybody has to understand what this means. You're the decision maker. And you're controlling whatever, you know, you're controlling this system. And you're saying, I'm going to apply a control u at any time t so that the resulting dynamics gives me the state x at each time t. Then the objective is to minimize an expression like this involving x and u. Okay? But the functional really depends on what decision you made, you know, what, it, what is the control you're actually applying. Okay? So it really is a, 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 minimiza is, it is a functional of u, of the admissible control, rather than of the state and of the admissible control, right? So that's, I mean, don't get confused. The book has x and u, but it's really x is determined by u. Okay, so we're going to say that, okay, and the other additional thing that one should, um, okay, um, if you allow me, I'm going to change from A to B to 0 to T. Okay, T will play the role of time and it starts at zero and ends up at a final time t, right? Just as in the very calculus of variation problems or variational problems, you may have initial conditions of the state and the final conditions of the state assigned, or you may not. Okay? Some might be missing. All right, so that's uh, that's the setup. Now, first, let's talk about uh, consider um, no restrictions on U on the control. So, any U is admissible. So there's no restriction on you, okay? So that is, you can you can be as big as you want at any time t, okay? And later, what we're going to do, which which is this principle actually, we're going to say, um, and later. We will consider uh, restrictions like u of t has to belong to some set fixed set. In if well, let's say u is is just one dimensional, then it would be could be like an interval. You could say the control can never exceed or go beyond certain two values. Um, if you use scalar, you could be, well, u belongs to minus 1 to 1, for instance. Yeah, that's an example of, of a set like this. If it's an, if u has three components, then the set might be some convex set in well, it doesn't have to be convex. Uh, some set in um, in R3, for instance, again, it could be a unit ball saying that the control we can apply or we are allowed to apply, uh, you know, cannot be bigger in magnitude than a certain number or something like that. Okay? But let's first consider no restrictions on you. Then here's uh, uh, sort of the uh, the strategy here. Okay, 
So uh, no restrictions on you. Oops. Okay. What we'd like to do is the following. We'd like to minimize. So consider the augmented functional and I mean basically it's the following integral from 0 to t f so that's the original one t x of t u of t minus or plus p of t I'll tell you in a second what is p of t here times little f minus x prime of t oh, let me, let me, I don't want to squeeze it too much here plus p of t f of t x of t u of t minus x prime of t so what where is this coming from this is like the like the f tilde that we had before okay, of course it's not it's not identical because we don't have you know x prime we have u okay? but if you think about the constraint that we have you're doing an optimization with a constraint. The constraint is that x prime has to equal this thing, right? So if you take this difference, then that would be the role of like this, that h, right? So the h, so this, would be, this could be the h of that's the equality constraint. The only thing is, h is not a uh, integral constraint. You don't have an integral of that integrand to be equal to something. It's a pointwise constraint. It's for each t. So pointwise constraint. Because it's pointwise, the, the z, remember we talked about the z times h. It was f plus z times h, right? That z has to be replaced by a function at each t, so a function of t, so that that z can, can change values for each t, okay? So this one is, is, plays the role of that, if you want Lagrange multiplier, z which appears in f tilde is f plus z h but because because our constraint is not integral constraint then and it's just pointwise then this should be allowed to depend on z on t okay so we give that name p okay um, and there's a problem with calling h because I'm going to use h for something else so let me just um, H1, I don't know, okay. or H of T, H of T. That's, H is not a good, give me another name, another letter. Um, J. J. So it plays the same role as the equality constraint from above, except it's a pointwise constraint. Okay, so <coughs> if we apply the Euler-Lagrange equation on this uh, on this um, functional, then. or for this functional is going to end up looking like this
problem is we're gonna we have more variables now than than we had before. So there is partial of f tilde, and that's the same f tilde as the integrand, with respect to x minus derivative with respect to t partial f with respect to x prime okay, equals zero. So what is this? What's the partial of f with respect to x? Well, what does x appear in that integrand? In capital F and also in little f, right? So that's this plus p partial of little f over the, with respect to x. And where does x prime appear in this? Only here, right? With a minus n times p, so that's minus p prime, right? Let's not put off t here, just p prime for now. But prime is with respect to t, right? Everybody's with me now? You've got to get pretty comfortable with differentiating with respect to x prime, but x prime is not really, it's independent of x in this computation. Um, and also there is uh, there is there is u. So is this f tilde with respect to u minus derivative with respect to t of this with respect to u prime? And remember, there's no u prime. There's just u, and the the, the, the u appears only in, again in f and in little f, in capital F and in little f. But this is zero, right? So, so there's no f prime. And finally, there is uh, p. So there is partial of capital of f tilde, capital f tilde with respect to p minus d by dt of partial f tilde with respect to p prime. There is no p prime there. And if you look, what is where is p appearing? Well, p appearing only with this coefficient. So that's the derivative. So it's f minus x prime and 0, right? So when you put this together, what you see is you see the following. p prime has to equal partial of f with respect to x plus p partial of f with respect to x. One is capital, one is small. The other one is... zero is partial of f with respect to u plus p partial of f with respect to u and x prime of t equals f of t x of t u of t that's the third one right so here's the here's the kind of the um, the key here so denoting h to be f, capital F plus p little f. This is going to be extremely important. It's going to be called Hamiltonian. Just like the integrand is sometimes called for the uh, variational problem is called Lagrangian. So this is Hamiltonian. Then look at what this is saying. This is saying p prime equals the partial of, so I already see a typo from my, on my handout, p prime of t is partial of h with respect to x, okay? Let me, let me, 
there is, I mean, the most difficult thing here is putting the right uh, uh, arguments. Okay. So right now I'm going to be kind of uh, skipping that step. Um, zero equals partial of h with respect to u. N x prime equals partial of h with respect to p. Oh, okay. So I'm, I missed a sign here. Here should have been a plus. Yep. So then, yep, 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 yep. So here you differentiate with respect to x prime is minus p, and that gets differentiated, so it's plus p prime. So this is, there's a plus here, and that makes this a minus. Yeah, okay, so there's no typo, I'm sorry. So when I do this, this is minus, okay? I cannot, I don't have enough colors to kind of highlight this thing. Because this kind of uh, summarizes the principle. <clears throat> and again, it summarizes even the principle when you when you have uh, constraints controls, constraint control, uh, admissible controls that are cons that are restricted. Um, what is this thing? I mean, this cryptic thing saying. This says you have your optimal control problem, and it, it's set up in this form. You have an, uh, an integrand where the objective function is, right? You have a, a differential equation where the control comes in, okay? What we do is we introduce sort of a variable that plays the role of a Lagrange multiplier, okay? P and it basically has the same number of components as the um, differential equation or differential system, right? The dynamical system. So if you have five uh, variables describing this, the state variables describing the system, it's going to be five differential equations, right? Then you're going to have five um, P's called cold states. And F is going to be basically the right-hand side of those differential equations, five of them, right? And what does P times F mean? It's basically going to be, mean P is a row, F is a column. So you multiply a row times a column, right? So look in the handout. Construct the Hamiltonian is the following. Is F is capital F plus P1 F1 plus P2 F2 plus Pn Fn. Okay? If you have multiple components, multiple, I mean, if you have several state variables. Okay? Now, what do these variables have to satisfy? Well, they have to satisfy, in order to have an optimal solution, the least that they have to satisfy is the Euler Lagrange equations for the augmented system. That means that translates in the following. Well, it translates in the fact that x prime has to be, well, that's obvious. That's that x has to satisfy the differential equations. It's just a fancy way of writing it. But just for symmetry, it's written like this. But p prime has to satisfy this guy this differential equations. Okay? Now, if you have multiple components, then there's going to be each component of P has to be minus partial of H with respect to the respective component of X. So it's a system, right? Now, before we talk about this, so let's understand a little bit better what is P, what is co-states. So P is called a co-states. So x, x1, xn are the state variables. P, p1, p2, 
Pn are the called the costates or the adjoint variables or the dual variables, whatever you want to say. Okay? And they satisfy the following derivative or p p uh, you know p prime p i or j prime minus partial of h with respect to x j okay but here's the kicker um, imagine lo look back at at h okay where is p showing up um, excuse me where is yeah where is x showing up X showing up in F, capital F, and little f, right? When you take the partial derivatives with respect to an X, that's minus partial of F with respect to X. J minus or plus P partial of little f with respect to XJ. And again, this is P is P1 through Pn. So basically, the right-hand side is linear in Pj, in Pi. We'll see an example in a second. But the differential equation that the adjoint or the co-state variables satisfy is a linear system. And when you hear the word linear versus nonlinear, it's always a good thing, right? So that's the key why this is actually practical principle of, of finding optimal or, or necessary condition for optimal. Is that you're introducing this kind of uh, shadow variables. In fact, they are shadow prices similar to shadow prices. You, you introduce the shadow variables, you have no, I mean, what, what do they mean? They just satisfy a linear system. And how about initial conditions or final conditions? You know, when you have a differential equation, you need to know the initial conditions so you know what the solution is. Well, in this case, these are basically the natural boundary conditions that you have to impose initially for the initial problem. Well, if x of 0 is x0 and x of t, if both are present, no, none for p. Okay? But what if you only have initial conditions, but not so free? Then we're going to impose the natural boundary conditions. And what are the natural boundary conditions? Turn out to be, go back to uh, this augmented one, right? What are the natural boundary conditions? The derivative of this with respect to x prime have to, has to equal 0. Well, what's the derivative with respect to x prime? It's p or minus p. So minus p has to be 0. So these are the natural or transversality. And again, that's just f with respect to x prime, f tilde. Right? Which in this case turn out to be just at capital T. Or natural boundary. And what if there is no initial condition for this for the final state for the for the for the state variables and no boundary condition free at both ends? Then P has to be zero at both ends, right? What if 
I have x1 and x2, so I have two components, state, state variables. But only I specify the final x1, and I let free x2. Then, only one component of p has to be set to be zero. The other one is to let free. I mean, no, no, not specified, right? So these are always complementary. Like, again, if I have five components this, uh, the, 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 for the state variables, then here I have 10, right? I'd have 10 variables, uh, 10, 10 conditions. But if, and, and then no condition on p, right? But what if I have only six? Like all initial conditions and one final condition for x3. Then I have to have p1, p2, p4, and p5 set to zero. Right? And the reason why that's important is, is you're, you'd like to be able to solve this completely. Well, I have five equations here, and I have five equations here. So I need 10 initial conditions. Well, they may not all be initial conditions. There may be six initial conditions for x and four terminal conditions for p, which makes this uh, boundary value problem rather than an initial value problem. In many cases, so even if and we'll, after the break we'll talk about this, but say I have x prime equals x plus u. I'm trying to just x is x in R, okay? And I have initial condition x0 equals x0, right? And I'm trying to minimize um, uh, an integral from 0 to capital T of, well, I'm just going to make it up, but so you minimize that, right? Okay. Well, how do we write the Hamiltonian? And, and, and I guess, well, let's do it without arguments now, and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of specialize. It's going to be x squared plus u squared, right? That's f. Plus, how many variables do we have? Well, Co-state variable, just one, right? So that's going to call it p times x plus u. That's little f. Isn't that beautiful? It's like... First grade mathematics, you just put those where they are. I mean, just copy them, right? Okay, and now now what? Well, now let's see what, what these shadow variables have to satisfy. Well, have to satisfy minus partial of h with respect to x. Well, there's x. So it's minus 2x plus p. With a minus, right? So it means that p prime equals minus 2x minus p. Any surprise that is linear in p? No, it's always going to be linear in p. Even if you have p1, p2, it's going to be a system of two equations with linear in the right hand side. Uh, but what's What's, what condition, I mean, what is, this is a differential equation. If we don't specify initial conditions, we won't be able to solve it, really, right? We need to solve this, but we're not with initial conditions, but with terminal condition for P, okay? So the system to be solved, so that means the system in X and P is the following. X prime equals X plus U. P prime 
equals minus 2x minus p. Okay? x of 0 is x0. Zero. p of t is 0. And what's weird about this thing? I have I have u in there, right? How on earth am I going to be able to solve that if I don't know u? If I knew u, I could solve it, right? Because the system of two equations, uh, differential equations with two unknowns, and it's actually linear in both x and p. It just happens to be in this case. In p is always linear, but in x it happens to be linear as well. And here's where that extra thing, which again, I don't have enough colors, but u is chosen to minimize h. So you're going to have to use, this is going to be the, not any u, but it's going to be a special u such that the h of u is the minimum of all admissible use, okay? And what's what does it look in this example? And I may have H, H has U in it, okay? And so far we didn't pay attention to that, but now, and that's the principle. This is the principle. It's find the the U that minimizes this Hamiltonian. Well, you can see it's a quadratic thing. So there is a, I mean, how do you find the minimum of a quadratic when you have no constraints? Set the derivative equal to zero with respect to u. So that's why is 2u plus p. So remember, h was, and again, now I, I want to, I'm sorry, uh, is, I want to think of this as, is that like that? I want to think of this as a function of u. So h is a function of u. Everything else is frozen. Time is frozen, x is frozen, p is frozen. At each time, I want to, I want to uh, find a minimum u, I mean the u that minimizes that. And that basically says u is minus p over 2. Okay? So at each time, I'm going to pick the optimal to be this expression of p, which p comes from solving that differential system. So finally, we're back to writing a system that we can solve. Is x minus p over 2 and p prime is minus, what was that? 2x plus p. Minus p, minus p. Okay? If you didn't bring lunch, you may be able to solve this over the break. I mean, <laughs> but um, otherwise, I'll show you. This gives you x and p. P just discard. Well, not quite. But what you're interested in is in x, right? Actually, you're interested in p because p will give you u. And in these problems, what do you want to know? You want to know the optimal u that determines the optimal x. And both determine the optimal value. And that's it. U is going to be minus B star over 2. And optimal value is going to be I of U star, which is the integral of F of x star, u star. So that's the strategy. Okay. So we'll take a break uh, for 10 minutes and come back.